Hey folks, Quilly Team here, and welcome to another episode of our tutorial for Hearts of Iron 4 for complete beginners! And today we're finally going to talk about the Navy. Probably the Navy plus, like, politics and decisions. But we'll start with the Navy because I know a lot of people want to know all about that. So, there's two ways to access some of the information about your current Navy. One, there's still these buttons over here. These let you see all your existing army, all your existing air force, as well as all of your existing navy. But probably the better way to interact with the navy is, in fact, to switch over here into the strategic navy map mode. And you'll probably find this to be the most useful. The hotkey for this is F2. So if we do this, what it does, it really highlights the different sea zones that you can interact in, and it also shows you your current ships that you've got available. They are organized in fleets and in task force as of patch 1.6. So this is one of those things that is very different as of now than it was in the very recent past. So if we go ahead and click on one of these things and then right click, we can zoom in. So let me actually, sorry, zoom in. If you uh, select one and then right click on it, it'll actually pan the camera over, which is what I should have said. So ships can live in naval bases. They are built in dockyards. Let's go ahead and take a quick look at the production screen over here, um, which I have still filtered from the last time we were playing. Let me go ahead and reset it. Okay, so this is your typical research or production screen over here. So you produce various equipments that can then be distributed to your divisions, either your existing divisions or new divisions you are training in. But these don't actually make troops as is. They don't make, you know, armies and divisions and everything directly. However, when it comes to ships, it's very different because here you are specifically building ships that will then be instantly deployed in one of your ports and possibly attached to one of your existing task forces slash fleets. So for example here we're building some submarines. That's all we I currently have queued up in our in our Soviet little run over here. Now, one of the things you can do on this production screen is you can filter things out. Like if we're specifically just looking to deal with boats or ships, I should say, we can hide the infantry and artillery, we can hide the armored, and we can hide the planes. So now we're only looking at ships. One of the shortcuts you can do with this is if you shift click on a category, it will hide everything except that category. So if I shift click on aircraft, it'll only show me aircraft, very handy. There's actually three different categories for ship construction. There's capital ships, screen ships, and then other ships, which include submarines as well as convoys over here. So that will show us what we're producing. Currently, as the Soviet Union, we're only producing submarines plus the convoys. Convoys are not ships you control directly. They get added to this pool of convoys over here, which are used to automatically um, move supply around for your military, perform trade, so any trades you perform on the trade screen that involve trading with something that's overseas, like say Brazil over here will require convoys. The other thing convoys get used for are for naval invasions, which we haven't actually looked at, and I'm gonna to try to remember to do that. You know, let's do it right now real quick before I forget again. I'm gonna make an army over here, a new army with three guys, just so that I've got them over here. I've got three dudes selected here, and let's say we're planning an invasion of Estonia over here. Now, of course, we can line up plenty of troops on the border with Estonia and try to go that way, but then we have to fight. It's the forest, you know, it's gonna be slow slogging. We think, hey, maybe we can do a sneak move where we just jump on the capital of Tallinn because if we capture their capital, they'll probably surrender right away because it's the only significant source of victory points in their country, really. So that might send them over the top. So let's plan a naval invasion. With an army selected, what you do is you hit the naval invasion order button over here note we don't i don't have transport planes and i don't have uh paratroopers so i can't demonstrate the paratrooper order but it's almost exactly the same as what we're going to do here for the naval invasion first what you do is you click this button and then what it's going to do it's going to highlight all your provinces that have a naval base this is where you start an invasion from so we could start an invasion you know from any of these naval bases or way over here, anyone over there. We're gonna say, listen, okay, we're gonna click on Helsinki. We're starting the invasion from Helsinki. Then what we have to do is we have to choose where the naval invasion is gonna go. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna right click the target province for that. So I'm gonna right click on Tallinn over here. And so the naval invasion, everyone's gonna group up in Helsinki, and then they're gonna get on some boats and try to invade Tallinn. You can split up your naval invasion to hit multiple provinces simultaneously. They all have to be in the same state as your primary target. So we're going to hit Tallinn, but I might say something like, you know what, I'm going to right click these two provinces here. And what will happen is the divisions when they do the naval invasion will split up among these things. So I just picked three guys right now, but what I could do is grab a handful of others. So we have a, a, a naval plan here. It's got three divisions assigned to it to do the invasion. One of the things, and it's not explicit, after you plan this invasion, hit enter. 
enter really properly locks in the evasion. Otherwise, you might see the invasion on the map here, but it might say zero divisions. And what you'd wanna do at that point is manually add your divisions to that invasion plan. Let's do that now. Let's say, you know what, three infantry division won't be enough. I expect the Estonians to put up more of a fight. I'm gonna grab a few more guys over here to throw in. So I'm gonna grab uh, these guys over here. So I did a little box selecting and then held shift to select you as well. So we got some people from a few different armies. With them selected, I'm gonna hold control and then click on here. So now I have eight division assigned. So they've been assigned to this army here, but they're also assigned to this invasion plan. So eight divisions are gonna land in these three provinces in a variety of different ways, and that's okay. There is a play button here. If we hit this, so now it's ready to execute. It won't execute right away. It won't execute right away for two reasons. One, we're not actually at war with Estonia, but even if we were, it wouldn't execute right away because first of all, not everyone's in position. Second of all, we have to reserve a certain amount of convoys. And you can see on this tooltip, it says we need 25 convoys. We currently have zero reserved. If I go and unpause, it'll grab some. There we go, it's grabbed 14. It grabbed 14 because that's all we had to spare. I need 25 available convoys to be able to invade here. I don't have quite enough. So the solution to that, unfortunately, would be to do an invasion with fewer people. So let's say I'm gonna take four of these guys over here and I'm gonna say, well, I guess you're not invading. I'm just gonna go and uh, assign you to a different army here. You can go off to the Eastern Front, have fun over there. So now, uh, which one is my naval invasion army? Well, you know there's a way to find out. One of the things you can do on a battle plan, well, actually, it's this guy over here. Because um, I was gonna, what I was about to say is not gonna apply to this, because normally you can click on these to select all the armies assigned to a plan, but I don't think that works with naval invasions. Anyway, it's this guy over, no, it's not. Who are you? There you go. Oh, it's this guy. This is my naval invasion army. So what I like to do a lot of times with my naval invasion people is I like to change their icon. There we go. So I know that these are my naval invasion people over here, so I don't lose them. Um, and yeah, they, they will automatically move to Helsinki. I can always encourage them to go there first in case they were still confused. Probably as soon as I unpaused, they would have gone to the right area. So they're going to move over there, and now my naval invasion um, has enough boats. It needs... It actually only needs 12. There we go. It needs 12 convoys to do it. So it's got 12 of 12 assigned over here. So we have two to spare, which is great. However, even then, even though I've hit play over here, and even though we have enough convoys, if we were at war, the invasion still wouldn't start right away because it takes a certain amount of time for the invasion to prepare. And the, the, the amount of time it takes depends on the number of divisions you have. Well, and how, how heavy those divisions are. The invasion timer, I think when we had the eight divisions, I think was 56 days. Now we have half as many divisions, it's taking half as long, I guess that makes sense. So it's gonna have to prepare for 28 days before it starts up. So if we go and we let it go, they'll get in position and you can see the timer start to tick up here and eventually it'll be ready to go. Now, we still can't go because we're not at war. But let's assume we were at war, and let's assume this timer had gone on completely and filled up to 28 days. We would actually still have an error in this list. Okay, go away, you guys, you pop-ups. Um, and you can actually see right over here, there's an error in red that says, we lack sufficient intel to dare sending an invasion through the region, upper Baltic Sea. If we hit F2 or click this button to go to the strategic naval view, you can see there's a sea zone called the upper Baltic Sea. We, don't have enough intel on this to be able to send an invasion through here. Basically, we just need boats. Radar, plane missions, those would work too, but ships are a really good way to get intel in this region so that the, we know that our convoys can go across here fine. The other thing is our convoys are very vulnerable to be attacked by Navy as well as um, um, uh, naval bombers while they're crossing. Uh, so if we don't have a naval presence here, they, our, our convoys could just get sunk along the way and we could lose all our guys. So we're going to want to make sure to do something about that. So with all that, nine minutes into this video, we're going to go back to talking about the Navy. Whew. All right. So we have a handful of different fleets over here and the fleets can have multiple task forces. That's how these things are organized. So we're going to start by looking at this fleet here, this dark blue Severny Flot. Let, let's, let's rename this to something like um, Baltic Fleet. So that we know what we're talking about. Okay, so this is the Baltic fleet over here in the dark blue. I'm gonna give it a much more distinctive color. We're gonna we're gonna give it a pink color over here. So we're talking about the pink so-called Baltic fleet over here. And this fleet has two task forces in it. It has the first task force here, which has six destroyers, and a second task force with six submarines. 
This, again, this is very different in 1.6 from anything previously. A fleet operates in a number of sea zones. It can operate in multiple different sea zones at the same time. Um, basically as many as you want, barring, you know, certain, certain access things and, and knowledge and whatever, but that's okay. So the fleets operate in a certain sea zones, but each task force gets assigned a specific job. So this fleet over here is kind of interesting. Destroyers move around quite quickly and are good at spotting things. That, that's what destroyers are really good at. They're also sort of screening elements um, to protect your bigger ships by spotting things. They also tend to be really good at having anti-submarine weapons, so on and so forth. For example, a lone battleship could easily be sunk by a single submarine with, the, with the torpedoes um, and never see what's coming. So you tend to protect your big ships with destroyers, but you know, they're also good for just generally patrolling some of these small seas or, or any sea really, and just spotting things. And they're fast enough that if they fight, they find a bigger ship, like if they, if they ran into a random battleship, the destroyer would be fast enough to just flee um, and, and survive just fine. So with me, with this Baltic fleet, what we're going to do is we're going to have them uh, patrol both the upper and lower Baltic. Okay. We're going to have them hang around over here. And so what we have to do is we have to give them some sort of mission. So let me take this first task force over here. Okay. Task force here with the destroyers. What I'm going to do is I'm going to, if I right click, I just tell you to move somewhere, which is fine. But what I want to do is give you a job. I'm going to give you a patrol job. And it automatically selects the sea zone adjacent to wherever you are. But what you can do is you can right click more sea zones. So what we're doing is we're right clicking these three sea zones over here to patrol in. Now these are color coded because we don't have enough information here. We have like no info on these areas. So they're red, but our ships will still patrol around here and try to do some things. So on patrol, the ships are constantly moving around trying to, to spot enemies. Um, they may also engage in combat. The, this uh, task force is told to engage at medium risk. We could change these rules. Oh, change these rules over here. Engage at high risk. No, that sounds bad. Um, we could change it to always engage. No, we could say do not engage, but we can click, click it over here. And I think that's what we want. Engage at low risk. If you find someone all by themselves, that you can take with just destroyers, go for it. But otherwise, that's not your job. Your job is gonna be to spot things. Then, in the same fleet, I'm gonna click on the second task force. These are our submarines over here. Now, because this is part of the same fleet, they will operate in the same sea zones. Whatever I've got selected, that'll be the same. I mean, we can we can add more, we can remove sea zones, but it's gonna it's gonna affect both, both task force in the same fleet. These are submarines. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna tell them, your job, is gonna be convoy rating. You're gonna look for enemy convoys, these are gonna be supply ships, and you're gonna sink the hell out of them. This is going to prevent the enemy from trading overseas, this is gonna prevent the enemy from moving supplies overseas, and it's also gonna interrupt any naval invasion the enemy might be thinking of. We're gonna to try to do damage to their shipping. So we're gonna use destroyers to help us spot things, and we're gonna use the submarines to help us hunt down enemy trading capacity. Hey, that sounds pretty lovely. I like it. Now, this fleet here um, can be assigned some a commander. So the fleet as a whole, you can see here the Baltic fleet. We're going to go ahead and assign a commander. And we're doing a lot of submarine action. Do we have someone who's got a bonus to submarines? Oh, we got green water expert for shallow seas. That sounds good. Although this admiral here has got the sea wolf, so his submarines attack better. Maybe we'll go ahead and use you. There we go. So you're going to be in charge in this fleet. Um, and you've got access to both some destroyers and some submarines. Now, whether or not this configuration makes sense, I have no idea, but we're gonna go with that. Now, what else do we have? We have some more fleets over here. Now, one of the things we can do, um, so you are, okay, you're in the, the Black Sea. So dark blue and this green, they're both in uh, Leningrad as well. Let's say I want to combine all four of these task forces into one fleet. What I can do is I can select this task force and then just right click up here to add it to the fleet. And I'll do the same thing with this task force. I'll add them there. So now I have a fleet with four different task forces. And maybe I'm like, you know what? That's not how I want it organized. I want, um, what do I want? I'm gonna want these two destroyers over here. Let's just add them. So, um, can I do it that way? Oh no, I, I remember how to do it. I'm gonna hold shift, select these two and I'm gonna merge these two task forces together. So now, instead of having those two destroyers on their own, I've added them to the battleships. Or maybe I'm like, oh, you know what? That was a mistake. I, I still want some destroyers to be able to spot for us. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna select four of these destroyers over here, and I'm gonna go and make a new 
um, fleet with you right over here, or rather new task force. So I've done that. So there we go. Now I've got a task force with four destroyers. So I've got one destroyer, one task force with two battleships, um, as well as seven destroyers. And then I've got the extra task force over here that can maybe do some spotting for me. Hey, that is really, really, really fantastic. My other two task forces are full of submarines over here. Maybe I want to, the submarines to um, operate independently. So I might want to split them off into their own fleet completely, which I can totally do um as well um so you know you can rearrange things as much as you want you can create new theaters as well right like um this is the black sea it might be really convenient to make an explicitly named different theaters theaters have no no real in-game impact whatsoever um more or less uh so and there's a couple of things with like organizing reinforcements but effectively effectively they have no mechanical difference it just affects your organization so we'll have you be black sea that's going to be okay and one of the things is we don't have anyone out in uh, in Asia. And maybe we'd want that, right? We know there might be some kerfuffleage with the Japanese. So we might want to have some sort of presence out there. Guarding in the Sea of Japan, maybe even the Yellow Sea and East China Sea, especially if anything breaks out. What if we got a ton of submarines over here and we were able to prevent any reinforcements from mainland, from the island of Japan over to the mainland over here? Hey, that sounds pretty good to me. So what we're going to do is we're going to take, um, I say, these four destroyers and the stack of 21 submarines. I'm going to make a new theater over here and I'm going to call this, um, uh, I don't know, the Japanese theater. Because that's sort of what we're doing. Kind of makes sense. Excellent. And what I want these guys to do is I'm going to want you over here to, to patrol the Sea of Japan, the Yellow Sea, and the East China Sea. So we've done that, which is going to be great. Now, I think... I think that's good. Yeah. Out of range, that's okay. I can't assign you. I can't. See, I'm worried... You can shift click to remove. I'm worried that they may have still gotten an assignment over here. Yeah, active in regions five. And I think because when you assign them a job, they automatically get assigned to whatever is adjacent to where they are. Oh, these guys, I think, still had the old job over here. No, I'm not entirely sure. What I might want to do to avoid the problem is I'm going to go and tell them to hold. I'm going to tell both of these task forces, listen, just, uh, you, you don't have any job right now. That's fine. Just make your way way over here. So they're just going to, they're just going to drive over here. I guess sail over here. And I figure once they arrive, I'll start giving them orders. Hey, that's going to be fine. Good. Excellent. Now, what if I looked at this and I'm like, okay, listen, I've got these 21 subs. That's pretty good. They're, they're going to be active over here, which I guess is fine. Um, but these four destroyers, I, I would really like more destroyers in here. How do I do that? Well, there's, I mean, first of all, we need to build more, right? So we are we are currently producing some destroyers. Or we're not producing destroyers, we're producing submarines. Uh, seven and seven and six. Okay, I'm, we're going we're gonna to pull back on the submarines. I'm going to let these submarine jobs finish. And maybe what I'll do is I'll keep one on infinite. So we will infinitely produce submarines. That's fine. You know, using maybe three dockyards, that's going to be okay. Um... But we'll let these jobs finish first, and that's going to be fine. Uh, and then what I want to do is I also want to build some destroyers. So we can do that by simply selecting the destroyer in the list. Uh, interesting, there's two different variations of the destroyer over here. They're both, they're both destroyer one. They might have slightly different configuration. Now, if you have manned the guns, you'll be able to go and create a massive, massive variation of your ships. Huge amount of work to, to modify these and customize these. As is... Ah, okay, there we go. So the Offrey class over here, Destroyer, if we click on the variant here, it has level zero torpedo anti-air, anti-submarine weapons and engines. If we take a look at the Leningrad and Minsk version of it, it has level three upgrades to all these categories. So this is a much, much better Destroyer. If you have any naval experience points, you can go and improve these things. So we can improve our torpedo attack. It does recruit, reduce our maximum speed and our range, like that's the the naval range, right? How far from our, our, our port we can operate. But you can do that. You could boost the engine. You could do all these things. It does cost you naval experience to go and be able to do that. We don't have any right now, so we can't do it. So anyway, we want this Landingrad and Minsk class to be produced, um, which would be under screen ships, right? As opposed to the other ships over here. So we'll just make sure it's in the list. And yeah, we could say the same thing, like produce infinitely, and they'll show up somewhere. This is by default, it deploys to automatically somewhere. Right now it's gonna be doing Crimea. 
I could force it to deploy somewhere else. I could say, hey, listen, I really want you to deploy here. So now it's going to deploy to Vladivostok. We could also say something like, hey, I would like you to deploy to a specific fleet. So this task force right over here, that's where I want you to deploy. And you'll automatically join that task force. If you, um, can I clear it at this point? Not right clicking would do it. Interesting. I don't know how to get you back to auto. Huh, that's interesting. I don't know what the answer to that is. There you go, we'll do that. You can also change um, what the name of the uh, the vessel will be. It automatically names things, but you can you can choose a name if you'd like to specifically name it. Anyway, so ships will start to get built, and by default, ships, I believe, if they're on auto, they will appear in this reserve fleet for a theater. So we actually have 15 ships just sitting around here. They're not in any task force whatsoever, because that's where they show up. And then what you can do is you can grab these and say, listen, we're gonna take these destroyers over here, and I'll add them, uh, just right click on this task force. Yeah, I would thought you'd be able to do that. No, that just moves everything. That's not what I want to do. I guess I'll create a new task force and then take you and move you into here and then merge you up. It feels a little awkward. I feel like there, there could be something to do there to improve that. I, I don't know. Um, but in any case, we've got this task force over here and some people are going to merge up to it. We can actually automate some of the task of refilling these ships because this button over here opens up the task force composition editor. And what we can do is put in requests. We can say, listen, ultimately this task force, we want it to have, I don't know, 10 destroyers. And you know what? A couple of light cruisers in there as well, just for a little bit more oomph. So I can say, okay. And then by default, if you've done this, this button gets turned on. This enables automatic reinforcement of a task force. It will pull ships from the reserve fleet of its theater in order to match the requirements set. When enabled, the requirements are shown below the actual number of ships in the task force. You can see here we have four of 10 destroyers, although four more are coming soon to join us. And we have zero of two light cruisers. So if they were get built and get added to the correct reserve um, theater, those ships should get added to the task force as well. I do find that that function works a little bit weird. Like it doesn't grab, I think, any um, that are sitting around already in the reserves. I think it's just as, as one get built, or maybe it's like every now and again, it'll go ahead and do something. I don't know. But there we go. We have now gotten some ship deployment going down and they can operate. We haven't talked about all of the types of orders yet. Um, I'm going to go back to our blue fleet over here. So this is our fleet that's got um, our main sort of battle force over here. Two battleships and a bunch of destroyers. So let's say I wanted them to be active in the Baltic as well. Well, I could put them on patrol. Right, and if I've done that, do something like this. So now they're going to go ahead and patrol around these seas. Now, patrol is very active. They're going to be out. They're going to be patrolling around. They're going to be burning fuel and looking for things. If we don't have enough fuel to be able to afford this constant action, this might not be the right way to operate. This fleet here is going to be quite slow with these battleships. It's not a fast moving fleet. It might actually be really bad at spotting things. Instead of having this task force be on patrol, we're going to put it on strike force instead. Strike force means this fleet will stay docked until an enemy fleet gets spotted, at which point they will run out and go kick some butt. So while they're sitting around docked, they're not vulnerable to attack. Well, I mean, there's port strikes, but ignore that. Um, they don't burn any fuel, right? So it's much more economical to keep them docked until they need to go out to fight. And so that might be a really good thing to do with your battleship fleets because battleships take up a lot of fuel, for example. That's a possibility. And what we could do, it's got a bunch of submarines. We could put those submarines out on, say, convoy raiding as well. So the submarines will be out raiding convoys, and they might spot enemies for our other fleets to go and hit along there. The last button we didn't look at here is convoy escort. So this would be, um, this your fleets would focus on defending your own, con your own con convoys. So this would be a good job for your destroyers to have to try to protect your own convoys from enemy submarines, for example. There's one over here that you're not going to use necessarily as often, but this is naval invasion support. This is to specifically have your fleets guard your naval invasions while they're underway. Um, and so depending on if you're talking about an area where you really, you can't just be there in general, you're not going to be really projecting a lot of naval force. Um, 
so your convoys are going to be at risk because you're not really strong enough. You might want to have your fleets focused specifically on defending your convoys rather than being all over the, the fleet zone. This button here is just to anchor. You just stop wherever you are. Um, and, uh, and then this button over here is to start naval exercises. They will just simply train. They will get experience points. These are all green, so it might be a really good idea to do that. They will, of course, be using fuel along the way. They might also be damaged. By default, your fleets, when they take damage, they will go and dock at a nearby uh, naval base. And they will utilize your dockyards. They will your dockyards will get used to build ships, but they will also be used to repair ships, um, and they get sort of borrowed by your naval bases to do that. Um, you can set a few specific uh, orders in terms of your ship's repair behavior. Automatic splitting can be on or off. If automatic splitting is off, ships that get damaged remove themselves from the task force, go park in a naval base, get repaired, and then automatically return to the task force. This is really nice if you don't want the entire task force to return to base just because one of your ships got a scratch on it. On the other hand, there is a risk because what's happening is if a bunch of ships get damaged and they just split off and go and park and go and dock themselves, the rest of them are still out there doing things, but they might be they're going to be a lot weaker. They're, I mean, they're only going to be, you know, maybe half as many ships out there, and that might be too few, and you might, and it might be too much of a risk. So, depending on what your fleets are there to do, you may want to have it on for some fleets and off for others, or rather for task forces, I should say. You also get the option of choosing how uh, what the repair priority is. If the repair priority is high, then again, even a light scratch, they're going to go and repair right away. You can go to never repair or low repair. They will only repair when they're heavily damaged, right? The ship is like on fire, half of it has fallen off into the ocean, and then the captain's like, yeah, maybe we should go to the mechanic and see what's going on. Having it on high repair priority is what I think most people do um, because they really don't want their ships fighting in damaged conditions. This button here is, we already looked at, that's your engagement rules, you know, how, how bold are you at fighting other vessels? And it does default at medium risk over there. Um, I think that's all the naval stuff. If you do have man the guns, the ship design screen is a little bit more involved, but that's beyond the scope of this tutorial, so we're gonna leave it there. I am gonna go ahead and fit in the political discussion at this point. So, if you click on your flag over here, this opens up your pol your politics panel for your country. Um, and it lets you take a look at the current status of your country, as well as adjust your laws and government. So, first of all, over here, you've got your leader, so the Soviet Union is being led by Joseph Stalin. If you mouse over here like I'm doing, the tooltip, which is currently showing his name, might have more information in it. So let's say we take a look at France, for example. Edouard de Ladier over here is a stout defender. So the AI, this is actually just a modifier to the AI here, is going to increase his focus on defense. But different people will have different traits. There we go. So uh, Stanley Baldwin over here has got a bonus. He generates more political power, and hiring political advisors is cheaper for Stanley. So different leaders might have different traits, and that can happen within your country as well um, as your government changes. Over here, this is the popularity of the various uh, political ideologies within your country. Red is communist, so very popular in the Soviet Union. Uh, surprise, surprise. Blue is democratic. There's a tiny yellow sliver right there. Yellow is fascist. And you might also have like a gray for non-aligned. So there's an example here in Romania. They're highly non-aligned. Non-aligned governments tend to be like monarchies and things like that, right? Democracies is free vote, fascism big strong guy with a mustache that takes over control and a communist hey it's a communist party everyone loves the party right um so whichever faction is the strongest will generally determine what government runs your country now it's not always a one-to-one -one ratio because in some countries you have elections and so there you might have to wait for the next election to see if the type of government changes for example um it, it, there's there's a variety of different ways that that can take effect but usually whatever um, is the most popular that's what you're going to be because those people will demand a referendum or there might start a civil war depending on your country and a variety of different faction factors that are in there you can affect the popularity of the party that is most popular within your country in a couple of different ways if we go into our politics screen if we look at political advisors most countries will have several different advisors that might be able to change the popularity of certain factions. For example, uh, Constantine over here is a fascist demagogue. If we were to go and recruit him as a political advisor, he would give us a daily fascism support boost of 0.10. 
Um, these, these are substantial numbers. This will, this will have a substantial impact on the growth of fascism in the Soviet Union. Um, and also appointing these people, the fascist supporters, democratic supporters, communist supporters, and whatever, will often go and trigger certain events as well for your country that might further increase uh, the rate at which things change. Not only that, but they can also unlock more decisions for you. So if you do want to make a change in government, assigning one of, or appointing one of these political advisors that move your country in a certain direction will be very, very, very potent. So if you've got that. The other thing is a lot of national focuses, uh, not so much in Russia, but if we look at someone who is uh, has a generic focus tree over here, for example. So we've got um, internationalism focus over here, which would make Turkey more communist every day. And some of these things might also unlock more types of leaders that can be recruited to do certain influences and things like that. Um, the other thing you can do is you can influence other countries. If I go to the diplomatic view with Turkey, I can go and boost the popularity of communists in Turkey. It costs me political power, but I will slowly turn Turkey more and more communist. That might convince them to change to communism on their own, or I might decide to stage a coup on behalf of the communists um, and, and encourage the communists in the country to rise up in revolt. The more communists there are, the more successful that might be. It's sort of high-end stuff, though. Um, the other thing you can look at here is national spirits. Every country may have various spirits. These are, are just some sort of bonus or penalty or other effect that is modifying your country. So we've got a few things going on here in the Soviet Union that has some impact on our country and may also lead to various events being triggered. So for, for example here, uh, Mr. Stalin is very concerned that there might be a Trotskyite plot. It lowers the stability in our country and could also trigger some other events while that's going on. Uh, we have no elections that actually run here, so it would have to be some sort of referendum or a civil war or a coup or something like that that would turn us from communist to something else. Okay, down here we've got laws and government. So to change anything down here will require political power. That's over here, political power. Every country generates a base value of two political power every single day. If you have high stability, if you have certain people in your government, if you have certain national spirits, <clears throat> excuse me, you might generate more or less. The other thing is whenever you're working on a national focus, working on a national focus, whatever that might be, consumes one political power per day. Now, normally it's worth working on your national focuses. You very rarely do not want to be working on national focus, but if you really need to squeeze out a little extra political power for an incredibly important law change, you might hold off on your national focus for a little while to do that. Do keep in mind some of the national focuses, like socialist realism, actually gives us political power as a reward for finishing it. So sometimes you come out ahead. All right, what do you do with the political power? So you assign stuff down here. Some of these slots are for various advisors. They are empty and therefore have nothing going on until you point someone to them. So you can see all these guys happen to cost 150 political power to go and assign them. So if I wanted to, um, you know, if I wanted to put in this captain of industry so I can build things faster, it would take 150 political power and he would be in here occupying one of my three political advisor slots. These three slots here choose from the same pool of people. So I can have three of these active in my country. You can change it later on, but it'll just cost you a whole other 150 political power to recruit someone new instead. So generally speaking, once you've picked one of these advisors, you're kind of going to run with them for the rest of the game. We've got that. We've got a few others like a theorist over here, which gives us bonuses to maybe uh, automatically gain some experience and some discounts to doctrines. You can have your industrial concern, which tends to give you a boost to researching either industry or electronics, although that will vary from country to country. Material designers, which can give you research boosts or potentially even improve various technologies. Same thing can happen here with heavy tank or tank designers. Um, can give you bonuses. So this is giving me a bonus to research armor speed as well as making my armor have, well, more armor. So armor is like tanks. So my tanks would have more armor. My tanks would have more heart attack, for example. You can have a ship designer and an aircraft designer as well. Your military staff down here, you can have a chief of the army, which can modify quite a few things. I mean, you'll look at those, they vary by country. We can have up to three military high command. So again, three of these people will be active at any one time. So those are appointments and things like that. There are three laws as well. The laws are a little bit different because there's always one of them active. So this is your trade category. You're always gonna have one of these trade laws active. As the Soviet Union, we started with export focus and you can switch that around. So the more freely you trade, the more of the goods you produce are available on the market. So if we look at the trade screen, we produce 193 oil over here. And some of it is being exported. People are purchasing 96 of our oil. 
Now, as a result, because they're purchasing that oil, we do get civilian factories out of that, right? If we want to import something, we have to spend civilian factories. But if someone is is taking resources from us, they are giving us civilian factories in exchange, which is very handy. Um, but maybe we don't want to give all these resources up. Maybe we need more of it to stay internally. And if so, we might end up switching to a more of a closed economy, for example, which would shut down how many resources, well, this would prevent any resources from being exported at all. Downside to that, we don't get the civilian factories. But in addition to that, having freer trade actually gives you bonuses. So if we go full free trade over here, we have 80% of our resources are available to the open market. Whether or not someone buys them is a whole other question. People might not actually need our resources, but we make up to 80% of them available while only reserving 20% of it for ourselves. If no one buys any of our stuff, then we have it all for ourselves. If they do, well, we'll you know, we might only keep a little bit of it, but on the other side, I guess we'll have a lot of civilian factories, so that's fine. But the benefit of being in free trade is you get a boost to construction speed, research speed, factory output, and dockyard output. So, you know, that is very, very good. So this is one of our three laws. Another law we have is con uh, our, our conscription laws. What kind of people get put into the military? We are starting off with volunteer only here, right? It's only people who willingly sign up to be in the military will be in the military. That means of our total population of our country, 1.5% of it will be available for our manpower over here. So you can see our total manpower is 2.49 or 2.46, which is presumably 1.5% of our total core population. Non-core territory, like what we took over from Finland, does not contribute the full amount over here, so we don't get quite as many from them. Oh yeah, we can see here our, our total population in the Soviet Union right now is 170, 164 million. If we were to change our laws, we would get more. So if we go to limited conscription, it's 2.5%, extensive conscription, 5%, by requirement, 10%. All adults serve 20%, and then finally scraping the barrel, a full 25% of our country's population would be drafted into our military. However, you'll notice as we go down to these more extreme um, laws, you start to get penalties to your your industry, right? As you're taking your, you know, you're taking healthy, eligible people out of the worker pool and putting them into the military. Well, that means they're not, you know, you're not using healthy people to run your factories. So you're gonna be producing things a lot more slowly. So this starts to get really desperate. Um, extensive conscription is the limit you can get without a real penalty. It does increase training time, right? You're not, you're not getting the best and the brightest anymore. So it takes longer to train the new troops, but at least there's no penalty to your economy. But once you get the service by requirement, then things start to get pretty darn harsh. You'll notice the cost and political power goes up as well. Now, the conscription laws are quite special because you only sort of have to pay the difference in cost from one to another. So extensive conscription costs 300 political power if I were to go to it directly. But if I first do limited conscription, which cost me 150, after that, it would only cost me another 150 to go to extensive conscription. So it's not so bad. You can build up slowly over time, you know, move to limited conscription, like as you run out of manpower, you go to limited conscription, then you'll get a bunch more. As you run out again, you go to extensive and so on and so forth. It's worth noting that as of a recent patch, you don't instantly get the new manpower added to your pool. With extensive conscription, for example, up to 5% of our population would be recruitable into our army. We don't instantly get that added to the manpower. It trickles in over the course of a few months, days, that sort of thing is, you know, people go and register and, and all the paperwork is, is dealt with, for example. Um, but it does come in pretty quickly. In addition to conscription laws, many countries might have very advisors or national focuses that will give them access to more and more of their recruitable population. One of the things, the uh, the countries with um, generic focus trees, like Turkey over here, these focus trees aren't terribly interesting, but man, oh man, you can get a lot more population available. You can see here, if we uh, if Turkey passes militarism, they get the recruitable population is 5%. That's in addition to their, um, their conscription laws. So they get to draft a huge part of their um, population. Military youth gives them another 2% as well. It's just they can really tap into a lot of their people from their military, which is really strong. Um, the final law to talk about is the economic laws over here. The economy laws determines uh, a few different things, but the most significant thing is first and foremost, how many of your factories have to be assigned to consumer goods. If we look over here at construction, We've got consumer goods over here. This is 18 of our of our civilian factories are being used just to produce 
toasters for the population to keep them happy. The population demands toasters. So 18 of our factories are building toasters for our population. Okay, it's not just toasters, it's all kinds of different things, but it, it goes towards that. The amount of factories that get used for consumer goods is a percentage of our total number of factories, total number of civilian and military factories. So we have 105. We currently have a war economy, which requires that we use 20% of that number as civilian goods, although because of our high stability, we can use 2% less. So 18% of our 105 equals apparently 18. So 18 consumer good factories are used over here. So it's total of civilian factories and military factories that determine how many civilian factories get used for consumer goods. Now, with your, your war, your economy laws here, depending on your laws, you can dramatically change how many factories get assigned. If we were a civilian economy, 35% of our factories would have to be consumer goods, whereas because we're in a war economy, only 20% do. That's a 15% difference. That's a lot, a lot of factories that we're getting to use to actually produce stuff as opposed to just keeping our population happy. In addition to that, there are other benefits. For example, we've got a, in war economy, we have a 20% boost to building military factories, for example. So usually what you want to do is you really want to move towards total, towards war economy as quickly as possible. War economy is the best. It goes um, civilian economy to early mobilization to partial mobilization to war economy. That's the order, right? 35%, 30 25 and then 20. Total mobilization is a little bit different. Total mobilization, you only need 10% consumer good factories, which is amazing. And you get a 30% boost to building military factories. It's really stupendous. The problem is with total mobilization, you actually lose 3% of your recruitable population. You lose manpower. The reason is you're so focused on developing your industry that you're actually prioritizing sending a few more people into industrial production than military. So going to total mobilization is probably not that common. It might be something if you can sneak it in like when you're not actively fighting, when you don't really need the manpower, then maybe you go to total mobilization for a while. But generally speaking, war economies where you're going to want to be as your target. So that covers all of the political screen over here. There's also the decision screen here as well. And this will vary greatly depending on your country, depending on what's going on, depending on what DLC you have installed. Um, all kinds of different factors will show up here, but these will be various decisions that you can take. Most of these decisions will require uh, political power to pass. So for example, if I wanna run war propaganda here, it costs me 150 political power. In addition to that, you can see there's prerequisites. There needs to be a certain amount of world tension, a certain amount of war support, or actually there has to be not enough war support. If your country has less than 50% war support, you're going to be able to run war propaganda and you would just do it by hitting the button. Now, when one of these um, decisions is available, you will get a pop up here. You see where it says decisions available. It's letting me know I can currently hit the button for promise of peace ban fascism or ban democratic parties. These are all things that are enabled. And those are in fact the three buttons that are lit up over here. Promise of peace, ban fascism, and ban political parties. Institute press censorship is green because I'm technically allowed to do it, but it's not lit up because I don't have enough political power. I need 150 for those, whereas these I can afford. The little green buttons here, this just tells you whether or not you can be notified by these decisions. Let's say you, you don't intend to ever do promises of peace. You can turn that off and you'll no longer get an alert for it. So it doesn't show up there. And if I also go and toggle off the ban fascism and ban democratic parties, I get no alert anymore. So you can use that. If there's something you keep being alerted about, but it's not something you actually intend to do, then just turn that off. Now, whether or not you do these will depend very much on your circumstance. Keep in mind, spending political power can be very painful, right? I would like to use this political power to change my conscription laws or to maybe appoint a political advisor. Those would be good. These are something I wanna do uh, at some point before the end of the game because this will give me a boost for the entirety of the game in some good way. So I may or may not wanna pass these decisions. It really depends on what you're wanting to do with your country. If you're gonna switch your country from say, you know, democratic to fascist or, or something like that, then you're gonna be very involved in these political actions to try to um, shift the importance of different parties. In multiplayer, people might be doing a bunch of like 
raise in popularity, right? In multiplayer, I might be explicitly trying to turn France communist, so you might do that. And if, if you're a person playing France and people are doing to, that to you and you really don't want to become communist, then you might end up passing decisions like banning the communist parties or something like that. So these are all things that you'll be able to do in defense of that. In single player, the AI doesn't really do that sort of thing of like influencing you. So mostly you're gonna use those if you're trying to make some shift away from what your country already was and you're trying to force things. If you do go ahead and you appoint someone um, on your staff to like turn you fascist or something like that, you will likely see a bunch of decisions here that will lead you to either doing a, a referendum or launching some sort of civil war. So those things will pop up over there. It really depends on your country. Um, and again, what kind of DLC you have installed. Is that everything? I think it might be. We talked about decisions, we talked about science, we talked about diplomacy, trade, construction, production, recruiting troops, logistics screens just keeps track of how much stuff you've got over here. Um, you can prioritize your fuel going to army or navy or air if there's some reason that you don't have enough and you're really concerned about that. Over here, this is the world tension. The more people start wars and just start trouble, the more the world tension goes up, which depending on what country you're playing may de change decisions. Like for example, as democratic countries, you're really not allowed to start any trouble uh, while the world tension is quite low. Here you can see a history of everything that has affected the world tension. Um, you can have it shown, uh, organized by date or by country or sort of based on what had the biggest change to world tension. You can also see all the current wars that are going on. Currently, the only war going on is the Spanish Civil War. I can click on this to see how each side is doing, right? Like that, if there were multiple countries on each side, they might have a slightly different war participation, which affects how they feel about peace. When there is war going on like this, um, and you're not involved in the war, you might be able to do things like send volunteers, for example. So this would allow us to send Russian troops to go and fight on behalf of, say, Republican Spain. That's what happened in my war against Finland. Germany sent troops to fight on behalf of Finland, even though Germany wasn't directly involved in the war. They were hoping to slow down the Soviet bear, but they were unable to do so. Um... These buttons here, hey, you can you can change the music. You can see what the music playlist is. You can skip songs. You can pause it. You can do whatever you want over here. Uh, this uh, button here shows you achievements, but you can only get that if you're playing in Iron Man mode, uh, which you have to set at the beginning. Uh, alerts, help, main menu. Uh, we've got a little folder here to show you the, all the different map modes. Oh, if you need to find a province, like you're like, um, where where is where is London? I don't know. You click on that. You're like. Oh, that's where London is. Ah, okay. Helpful little search uh, for some reason. These are just some extra map modes. Oh, day-night loop, right? By default, I think this is on. So if you hit play here, you'll see this like day-night cycle. If you go to speed five, I think it doesn't show the day-night cycle. Uh, it doesn't show it as a wipe, but it still happens. It still darkens and lightens. Or no, maybe not. Oh, when I pause, it, it affects it. But let's say, so let's say you really don't wipe this, this day-night wipe. Then you can go and turn it off with this button over here. That's quite common. Um, yeah, I think that's it. If you have any more questions, let me know in the chat. I would say the next thing to do, if you do need to learn more, watch some Let's Plays of Hearts of Iron 4. Of course, I have plenty on my channel, but lots of other people do as well. Um, and uh, that can be very helpful. Oh, we have outdated equipment in, um, in production. What is it? Oh, it's a tank. There we go. Our, our light tanks over here, the arrow, we're, we've, we've uh, gotten the technology for a new type of tank. So the BT-7 is light tank 2 as opposed to the T-26 is light tank 1. Um, if I do this, we will lose a bunch of our production efficiency as the factories have to be retooled for the new tank model, but these are going to be a lot better. And any tanks, any divisions that we're using tanks out in the field will try to upgrade automatically to the new version, so that's kind of nice. Folks, thank you very much for watching this. I will see you guys next time.